Hi, my name is Cindy Lopez. Welcome to CHC and to um, this parent education session tonight with Dr. Jude Wolf, um, helping kids with executive functioning issues manage behavior. So I'm just going to say a couple things about CHC and then I'll turn it over to Jude. So CHC has been here in Palo Alto about 65 years. We have four divisions. We have two schools, a clinic, and then Community Connections. Community Connections is um, the division at CHC that provides this community education that we do. We do teacher education, parent education, and continuing education for professionals. We also go out and do what we call off-sites, so schools ask us to come um, and do sessions for their parents or for uh, their teachers. Um, we also do a big um, conference in the spring. I think you guys were just talking about it, right? Um, so we do a big conference in the spring. It's called EdRev. Um, and it's at AT&T Park. This year will be May 4th, Saturday, May 4th at AT&T Park. Um, it is in this uh, community ed brochure that you have. With, um, on it's not like on every other um, seat tonight, but if you want one, I can, you, and you don't have one, I'll get you one. So there is a little page in here about the Expo, the EdRev Expo. That's a um, a, co um, a family day. It's actually for um, parents and kids and their activities on the field. There are sessions for parents, there are exhibitors, um, all kinds of things. It's a fun day at the park. Um, and it's focused on the one in five with learning and attention issues. So s those people who support and work with and have kids that part of the one in five with learning and attention issues plus the anxiety that usually accompanies that. This other flyer that's sitting on your chair, is a service we've had in the past, we are bringing back, and that's one-on-one -on -one executive function coaching for kids. So um, beginning after the holidays, um, we will be basically taking kids and working with them one-on-one -on -one around e executive function coaching, and all the information that you need is on this flyer, who to contact, the costs, and all that. Jude will be back in March to do another EF, another executive functioning session that's focused on uh, elementary school kids. So um, so I'm really glad um, Jude's here tonight. She's great. She's a um, good friend and colleague. We've worked together. We've played together. So um, she has passion for executive functioning and social emotional learning and mindfulness and I think you're going to um, see all of that coming out in the session tonight and um, so I think you're in for a treat. So I'll turn it over to Jude. I just want to make sure that everybody has the materials that they need um, to engage in our talk for this evening. So you should have a packet, the PowerPoint packet at this part, um, and then a com set of companion slides. Um, there will be active participation um, in, this, in this workshop. So there should be page four of six is the activity, the partner activity that um, just to anticipate um, your participation in this because there is a skill um, practice that I'd like to um, go ahead and model for you all. Um, and the packet really has a lot of information in there um, just to hone and focus the talk for this evening. Um, I'm not going to focus a lot on the, the last page of the companion slide, but I think it's pretty self-explanatory for all of you. So we can talk about this a little bit more after the main presentation should you have any more questions about this. So before I begin, I just really want to go ahead and just settle us in and just kind of do the transition to being present for this moment. I call the first slide as, as soon as I advance it, it'll be, it says gift of the breath. And through all of my practices, um, and I've been, you know, Cindy and I have been doing this for almost 25 years now and teaching wasn't my... Um, first, you know, profession. Third, if you count motherhood a career. It really would have helped if someone just helped me pause and inhale and exhale. So let's do that, you know, for just three breaths. And if it helps to close your eyes, just to settle in for the present moment and just really feel the presence, the ground 
beneath your feet, the chair you're sitting on. Take a deep breath in through your nose. And exhale through the mouth. Once again, inhale in. And one more time. Before I move on, I want, I've also brought this um, journal, um, journal article that called The Effect of Diaphragmatic Breathing on Attention, Negative Affect, and Stress in Healthy Adults. It's a long experimental study, um, very uh, convoluted with scientific terms. But in, in essence, what it says is that what we just did really resets your entire system and allows it to be more open and accepting into the information or in receiving the information that is to be had. And so as adults, um, managing our students or our families or little ones, it's helpful to set yourself in that kind of anchoring um, practice um, so that you can actually be present for your students or your kids who need more of that regulation because um, they don't have that. What is executive functioning? Executive functioning are skills that we see in the growth and development of our students. Um, it involves a lot of tasks and, and a lot of skills that need to be um, cultivated. They don't, they don't necessarily grow um, or they're not born with it, but they do need to be cultivated in a way where the students can practice it. The kids can go ahead and practice it with exercises or the way you've actually set up the environment in your home or in your classroom. We do witness developmental uh, markers in terms of their develop, uh, in terms of the development of executive functioning skills. And if you look at the companion slides um, on page three of six, I included the developmental tasks that require executive functioning skills. So you'll see there's the, the tasks that preschoolers, kindergarten to grade two, grades three through five, and grade six through eight. Um, and so, oh, I guess I didn't include the high school ones, but then there are the high school ones as well. So executive functioning really isn't just one skill. And so when, you know, when you're a parent and then your teacher says, well, they've got executive functioning, is it just organization and planning? No, it's not just organization and planning. It's really a network of skill capacities that really is developmental, it's contextual, and it's, an, it's environmental. So it's complex, it's multidimensional. When I say contextual, it, it's the executive functionings for a writing task is different from a math or a science lab or reading even, right? Reading at the, um, reading and annotating. Those are all very different contextually, very different set of skills that would be called upon to, to complete a task. Does that make sense? And then in an environment, clearly you have to set routines that are different from school and at home. But there needs to be a routine because kids need that, right? They need that guide to make sure that, oh yeah, when I'm at home, I transfer into this one. And then when I'm at school, teachers, that's the thing, that's, that's the first thing I always train when I say with my novice teachers, you need routines and procedures because that is the student's guide. They want that. If they don't know where to go, you can't address 25 different kids. Um, you need to tell them where to get the materials. You need to tell them explicitly, not just through verbal mediation, but also through visual mediation. So it needs to be written on the board. The student needs to know what to do when they first enter into the room. Do you ground them? Do you help them transition to the next one? Do you pause? By you doing that, you will see them. They will see you as the anchor that they need to move on to the next task. 
So these skills also are fine-tuned as they get older and as they get more information in their brain. They, K through five, very different brains than your adolescent brain. And it's exciting to have the adolescent brain because they're so, they want stimulus all the time. They want excitement. They want creativity. They want novice, novel. They want to be on, independent. So being the executive functioner for a teenager who lacks those skills is quite an exciting adventure. <laughs> I empathize. I have four. My, my own kids. So, um, but I, but they do. You know that's why we're all here to help each other grow um, those skills as well. I'm going to play a short video out of Harvard at the Center on the Developing Mind. It's a great um, short video on what executive functioning is. So let's have a look at it. Science tells us that brains, minds are built, not born. And at the center of this dynamic architecture are a set of skills called executive function and self-regulation. Children's self-regulation and executive function are key ingredients in their lifetime performance. It's not just about learning language or learning numbers or learning colors. We have to be able to work effectively with others, with distractions, with multiple demands. These actually are skills that contribute to the productivity of the American workforce. Look at your shapes. What should you have done next? Educators, I think, are, are looking for just this sort of thing. And when we describe what we mean by executive function, they say, yes, that's it. That's exactly you know, the problem, these kids, they can tell me these rules, but they can't actually use them. What's this? A toolbox. A toolbox. What is executive function? The safety goggles. Safety goggles. Probably the best way to think about it is sort of like an air traffic control system in the brain. Just like an air traffic control system has to manage lots of airplanes going on lots of runways and really exquisite timing and so on, a child has to manage a lot of information and avoid distractions. We really think of it as involving working memory and inhibitory control and mental flexibility. Take a situation where a child is having to take turns. So first of all, the child has to have inhibitory control. The child has to be able to stop whatever he or she is doing and let the other child take a turn. But when it's your turn again, you also have to remember what it is you're supposed to be doing. So that pulls on working memory. If the children who are taking the turns after you do something unpredictable, you have to be able to adjust what you're going to do next. And that requires mental flexibility. Children who are struggling with these capacities um, often look like children who just aren't paying attention or children who are deliberately not controlling themselves. If you don't have self-regulation, you act out and the teacher puts you in timeout, and so then you miss part of the learning that's going on and then you are more upset because you're behind and so you act out and so you get this downward spiral. How does executive function develop? Plus six, seven, seven, and plus four. In little children and even, you know, in the infant and toddler years, you begin to see the roots of executive functioning skills. What's going on in our brains is unbelievably intricate and complicated. The prefrontal cortex, or the front third of the brain, is important for executive function. But it's more than just prefrontal cortex. This region doesn't act alone. It's involved in controlling your behavior through its interactions with all other parts of the brain. The brain goes from a situation where you've got nearest neurons communicating very strongly with each other and ignoring the rest of the brain to these 
widespread networks that are connecting these different areas. Executive function changes over the life course. It improves radically over the first few years. I got a match prime. Uh, it continues to improve throughout adolescence. It's not until early adulthood that you have the adult type networks that are very strongly activated that connect different brain regions together. Let's take notes. Also, we believe that executive functions can be trained. It's just like going to the gym. So the more you practice in these areas, the stronger the capacity is likely to become because you're hoping to strengthen those neural connections. Mom, you're at 24. Slowly but surely, you're going to be able to step back and that child's going to go into the world with these skills where they can get along with other people, change rules, and they can be flexible, and they can accomplish new things, and they're unafraid. If we don't learn these skills during the childhood and adolescent years when they're coming online, we are really ill-equipped as an adult to hold a job, to maintain a marriage, <laughs> to raise children, to get along with each other, to basically be part of a civil society. You're okay. So I just thought that that was really helpful. I think that really encapsulates um, the science around executive function um, and the assumptions that underlies the whole concept of executive function as part of a neural capacity, part of the brain, um, really, really builds on the, the science of neuroplasticity, um, that the brain is malleable, that with intention and attention to specific parts of the brain, that we can grow these skills. It's really quite fascinating that when um, Dr. Bungie talked about, it's not just about the prefrontal cortex, but it's all about the different lobes of the brain that have been really not fully integrated. When you look at every single category in the DSM, the Diagnostic Statistical Manual for uh, Mental Illnesses, or it's about the disintegration of the brain. It's the rigidity, it's the inflexibility, that happens when, when human beings don't have the executive function integration of the entire brain. So when we talk about how do we grow executive functioning skills, it, we start at the very basic modeling of the routines and procedures. Um, and so it's helpful upon us adults who have the responsibility for younger ones to see, to reflect back on us and say, what are my own executive functioning skills? Um, what are my own goal setting, flexibility shifting skills, prioritization skills, working memory skills, and self-monitoring skills? This is just one process defined by the research ILD with um, Lynn Meltzer and, and um, Yale and Harvard as well. And, um, and these are really pithy types of constructs that we can use because it's also very operational in our, chi in our children's jobs as students. They have to goal set no matter what age they are. And I think as soon as we teach them that, it, as early as kindergarten, we can start to teach them about the concept of time and how you use this time. Um, flexibility and shifting, looking again in a brand new way. Um, this really comes into play in the math, um, in the math realm. We can solve math problems in many different ways. But when you're teaching a student different strategies, believe me, someone with cognitive inflexibility just believes in one way, and that is it, right? Math is about efficiency. And so they're not looking at different tools and looking at various ways to solving a problem. Then they're falling short, spending the another time, you know, the time in a different way. Does that make sense? Prioritizing and, organi and organizing is a scale that is always at the number one when, you know, when teachers say, well, you know, they need an executive functioning coach because they don't know how to prioritize and organize, right? 
But it, there's more than just that. But yes, that is um, usually the common symptom of an executive function deficit where they're not able to prioritize um, what to do in terms of their time. Um, they prefer playing video games or being with their friends and doing with their homework. So right now I'm with, in the high school level, I've taught K through 12 and even at you know graduate and, and um, undergrad. So I still have graduate students that you know, still need help with prioritizing and organizing, right? And so we are not done. Um, but, but there's hope, right? Because we can model that for each other as well. Um, prioritizing and organizing also comes into writing. So when writing um, becomes more demanding for students, especially in the fifth grade, middle school, and high school years, and writing was my area of research, um, it's multiple constructs. And when teachers tell you, well, you know, they have problems with writing. I always say, well, which part of writing? <laughs> because there are many stages of writing. There's at the grammar level, there's the idea generation level, there's the organization level. And are, what kind of writing is the student writing about? Is it a narrative? Is it an argument? Is it an expository? You know, all, all the common core standards, right? Those, those types of writing demand different types of graphic organizers and approaches so that we don't just say, here, Joey, go ahead and um, write about photosynthesis, right? We, the kids need more than that. So I'm, I, and I know teachers are doing that nowadays too. But I think sometimes when students have a, prob have a hard time generating ideas, there are more different kinds of tools that need to be put in place. Writing is very hard. And so even using academic language in terms of um, you know, writing vocabulary versus oral vocabulary, very different. Um, and so when, um, when teachers are teaching according to the Common Core, they want academic vocabulary. And that's vocabulary that our kids don't use in their daily language. So you have to pre-teach that. That's an executive functioning strategy for teachers. If they want their students to use that in their writing, they need to pre-teach it. Accessing working memory, the video talked a little bit more about that. And that, again, is about creating lists. It's about using the new information and, you, and, and holding them in memory and then engage, using that and engaging it in novel ways, like long division. Working memory is also writing about five paragraph, you know, writing about a, you know, in a five paragraph essay, um, argumentative essay. Writing, math, reading, they all require working memory. So that can also be honed. Self-monitoring, it's about my awareness of what I had just done and my reflective process and did I actually do it correctly? Did I pause? Am I going to correct it? Most, most of my high schoolers, they don't like to self-monitor. <laughs> they don't. And so our teachers have to create routines around reflection, you know, and, and especially in writing. Because writing is just the, I think it's the mother load of all skills that is um, not really being addressed as well as I would like. We've, you know, we've talked about these processes defined and goal setting, and they seem to just reside here in our prefrontal cortex. But what happens is that when you are not in the mood, when you are tired, when you are hungry, when you're, when you're too cold, when you haven't had dinner, right, you're not going to want a goal set. <laughs> you're not going to be flexible or shift. You're not going to want to hear other people's ideas that are different than yours and accept theirs as truth. Well, I know when I was, you know, raising my kids and such, I got very little sleep. So uh, my working memory was so shot. And so when you don't get enough sleep, and my teenagers in high school say, well, I don't get to, you know, Dr. Wolf, I don't get to bed until 2 o'clock, and, you know, and I just, then I get up at 6 o'clock, and well, why? So, and then they worry and they complain about not remembering and not being able to study. Well, well, the research shows that your brain needs to be 
in a relaxed state, in a healthy state, not in this flight, fight flight mode state, um, in order to integrate all of that new information that was in your working memory to go into long-term memory. A lot of students like to cram, right? And they don't, I, you know, learning, there's a, a, there's a scientific approach to learning, different workshop, but um, that's how you incorporate the working memory piece into long-term memory, by practice and drill and practice and practice. We need to really take a look at not just the prefrontal cortex, but the amygdala, th the area of the brain that really is in charge of our emotions. And, and if we don't, if we're slaves to the amygdala, the prefrontal cortex never comes online. So it does take a while for the upper part of the brain to really develop, and that's what that means when you develop executive function. How many of you have heard of Dr. Dan Siegel's work? I love Dan's, Dan's work. I was actually at an immersion weekend with him um, and using the interpersonal neurobiology piece that he's really promoting in his work. And he was actually invited by the Palo Alto School District a few years ago to speak with the community. So he's been here, he's been at Multiversity as well, and he's just got this new book aware. But he provides us with a really handy dandy model of the brain, um, teaching our, our kids also that we don't have to be slaves to our emotions and to our reactions. So he gives us this really nice um, pithy uh, model. One of the most rewarding experiences for me has been to study brain science and apply it to the experience of parenting. And the hand model of the brain that I use to teach parents is very useful to understand that. So if you take your thumb and put it in the middle of your palm, put your fingers over the top, this is a very useful model of the brain. And when we can actually see in front of us what's going on in the brain, then we can change what the brain does. So let me walk you through very basically what happens in this brain and the structures in it. And it goes like this. The spinal cord comes up representing the wrist. And then you have coming up into the skull, the brain stem and the limbic area, which work together to help regulate arousal and your emotions and the way you have a fight, flight, freeze response. These are below the cortex, the limbic and brainstem areas, and the cortex is this higher part of the brain that allows us to perceive the outside world, to think and reason. And this frontmost part of the brain, right behind your forehead, so the person's oriented like this, is actually the part that regulates the subcortical limbic and brainstem areas. This regulation is very important because sometimes we can have all sorts of things happen in our life. We're tired, we're exhausted, someone pushes a particular emotional button, and we can flip our lids. So rather than being tuned in and connected and balanced and flexible, we can lose all of that flexibility, even lose moral reasoning, and act in ways that are terrifying to others, including our children. Now, you can actually bring yourself back online and come back to the high road and make a repair with your child, and that's important to explain it to them. And you can also use this hand model of the brain to explain to children, even as young as five and six, how to understand when their emotions are rising up from the brainstem and limbic areas here, and how it's overriding the prefrontal area and making it so they may be about to flip their lids. So I've had kids come tell me that they're about to go flip their lids and they need a break. They need a timeout. And by even just naming that, they can tame it. And that's the power of using the hand model for ourselves and our children to help us all make sense of what goes on in the emotional communication that we have in the course of day-to-day -day life. I just really think that that's amazing to be able to communicate that with the young ones. Um, feeling the energy come up and gives them that sense of control over their own body and so that they're not able to just um, reactively strike out or um, or just you know do something that they'd really be sorry for um, and so I think putting our then teaching them that helps them feel get get a really more concrete sense of what's going on in their body so essentially you want to teach them that they don't have to be afraid of the storms, right? I mean, you know, we've all, you know, we all have had our own 
compensatory strategies to deal with not being afraid of the storms, whatever those storms are. And our students, they have their own storms. But what we want to do is really teach them how to sail their own ship, right? Because we can't always be there for them. And when we entrust them to educators in the schools, the educators then themselves need to teach the kids to be um, their own sailors, right? To sail their own ship. So I really love this, um, this quote. And then in the end, it's about resilience. It, that's all that is. When you have that executive functioning fully online, you know you can feel the overwhelm of the emotion, the joy, the elation, but then you can just come back to baseline and bounce back and say, okay, moving right along. What was I doing again? <laughs> you know, um, But just feel that, and that's part of the human condition. And teaching our students to feel that when they're younger will enable them to be a lot more resilient in the face of challenges, will allow them to face that the negative setbacks, will allow them to get the C, will allow them to you know, learn from the C and get it up to a B or get it up to an A, right? Um, and so those are some kinds of things that we need to teach our kids. Um, and I'm sure that's why we're all here. All right, strategies. Well, how do we do this? What's the strategy? So I like this acronym that I learned also from Dan's work is called PART. Um, presence, attunement, resonance, and trust. And um, there's a lot of research around social generative fields, around teachers engaging. How many of you have been in a classroom where you know that there's a master teacher in there and that teacher is just the maestro, right? Conducting that class in, in such a way where they've got, the teacher has that attention. It's really miraculous to see. Um, and it's nice because that teacher has that presence, attuned, resonant, and trust, building trust. So let's move on to that presence. So as a parent, you know, I had four and five years, right? One girl, three boys, and I didn't always listen first. <laughs> I was just flipping my lid all over the place, and I just couldn't, I didn't pause enough, right? I mean, that's confessions of a, you know, a young mom at the time. Um, and so, in, so I say that to say it's difficult to always listen first because I didn't really check in on my own agenda, right? So when you're going to be teaching executive functioning skills, I ask that we all impart that part, right? Being present. So when Joey comes home and has a note and says, you know, from the teacher that, you know, Joey didn't turn in his homework or he's got a detention, whatever, you know, my young me, my past self would have said, what, 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 what do you think you're doing? You know, what was that stupid, you know? And so I just go offline. And of course, what would Joey feel? Smaller than small. And there's no way in engaging him or her in a productive conversation, right? I needed to put myself on a timeout before, <laughs> before I engaged in a productive conversation. And what I've learned, to be quite honest, even in my high school um, uh, you know, career here with the kids, when teachers complain about a student saying, oh, you know, well, they didn't do the homework, or they're being ornery, or whatever, and I always say that there's a reason why a student comes to school and you judge that the behavior is not quite respectful, right? There's a reason why the student is acting that way, and so maybe engaging in that inquiry with the student where that the student isn't feeling defensive maybe can get you more out of the student than punitive measures. So I think that that's a really good approach in trusting the intent and gathering information from other teachers as well, right? Engaging the teacher is in a conversation about what, what do you observe Joey is doing over there? I'm wondering if, right, um, rather than going into the school and say, well, you know, you need to change X, Y, Z because my son isn't performing X, Y, Z, 
right? Um, so, so being present is that giving that full attention, that receiving a person's communication without judgment and curiosity. That's hard, right? That's hard, especially for our kiddos. You know, we want them to be successful. We don't want them to go through the same, you know, issues that we all went through. <laughs> so, um, and there's that sense of being felt. Like, you know, someone's really listening to me. That eye-to-eye -eye contact, right? That listening attentively. When a student with, is with me, I shut my computer um, down. Like, the screen's not on. My phone is on, you know, it's not even aware where they're at. You know, I can't reach my phone. I am present. And I've, that's a skill that I've had to really practice. Um, and I have to say, my, it's so nice that my kids can actually say that about me today. So my young adult kids. So it's, that was nice. I never thought that that would happen. <laughs> so it's nice to be able to, um, to hear that from your kids. OK, next is attunement. And there is a science of attunement. So on, the, um, um, on our companion slide, um, it's opening to our own internal sense, knowing how we're feeling, but not being overwhelmed by our own feelings so that we can actually attune to the other person's feelings. There's that connection, that interpersonal connection, where we focus not just on the verbal communication, but also the nonverbal, right? I often see students who are fidgety, right? Um, you know, not looking and, you know, and I know that there's a lot of energy going on there. There's not the, the focused attention that's being um, trained. You know, a lot of my students with ADHD struggle from that, right? Oh, squirrel, you know? <laughs> um, and so I'd like for you to acknowledge the squirrel and then I'd want you to get back to work, you know? That's nice, get back to work, you know? Um, and especially for kids with ADHD, that's actually their superpower because they can actually see a lot of what's going on. But what they can't do is to hone back their attention. I see, I see that that's going on, but I'm going to look at this. I see, but I'm going to look at this, right? That really is the issue around ADHD students. And so there's a lot of studies around mindfulness and ADHD. Um, on that, so I encourage you to you know take a look at that, and I can send those um, I can send those materials to you too if that's if you're interested in that. But really, begin, beginning to get engaged in attunement is really being part of their interpersonal experience. My high schoolers are always afraid; they're always combative, right? They're young adults, and they think I'm gonna do a gotcha on them. But I say no. I'm here to support you. I, I have no skin in this game, right? I want you to win. I want you to learn. How can I help you? Well, Miss So and So is going. Okay. So what's your part, right? And so they're off lid. So I'm the executive functioner that's helping them emotionally regulate to the point where they can actually see. Oh, there's a there's a solution to this. Um, so they're monitoring their emotional um, upheavals. And then they're bringing it back, back down to baseline so where they can pause and, go and have a compassionate response, right? The next piece is resonance, right? When a student feels resonant with you, you, you see a, a, a different body affect. They're relaxed. They're more open to learning. They're more open to engage. When I, I'm a, also an executive functioning coach, right? And so I'm having them do things that they don't want to do. So when I talk to parents, I said, I need to create a trusting relationship with these kids because they, the skill that I want them to do, they don't, it's too hard. And why would they take that from me if they don't know me? So that's part of teachers and parents in, in that Parents, kids see you as the authoritarian, right? So unless you've created that relationship with them to, um, that's a relationship of trust, it's, they're always going to, you know, extend their other self <laughs> and not um, act in a way that we would all like. So it's hard, it's not easy, but it requires a lot of work on our part. With all of that, then there's trust. I think that's the thing about good teachers is that the teachers make the child feel visible. 
the teachers know what their interests are, the teachers know what's difficult, and so the teacher knows to give the graphic organizer to this student, give a different graphic organizer to another student, um, and so that's a lot of orchestrating that goes on with the, in the classroom. So part can be cultivated, right? So that's when we really need to look at the scripts that we um, use in our, in our heads. For goal-directed persistence, what do you say to your students or to your child, right, when the, when the student kind of gives up on the goal? How do you redirect them so that you can um, encourage them without telling them, right? So reframing your scripts around these areas, these are some just sample scripts that you could use. Um, if you're already using them, that's great. But these are more targeted to the executive functioning processes early in the earlier slides. Even as teachers, you know, I, I actually in teacher training classes, I've trained teachers to start practicing their own dialogue because, you know, confessions of a new teacher at the time, you know, I was teaching in class and the um, and it was in a students in a school um, for kids with dyslexia and they have auditory processing and so I gave the information and then the student comes back to me and says well Dr. Uh, Miss Wolf what was this again I'm like well what did you hear me say right you don't do that <laughs> you don't do that because what does that make what does the student feel minimized right like you weren't paying attention well, of course, yes, he was paying attention, but the auditory processing was so slow, right? So, I mean, I needed to reframe my script. We all make mistakes. We grow from all of them, and, um, and I've become a better teacher, right? I had adults giving me feedback about that, too. And so, oops, you know, darn. So I think, you know, we learn and we forge on, and, and this is, we just build our skills over and over again, and we help each other through that. Um, flexibility, these are some, again, some more framing um, scripts that you could use, especially for metacognition, right? It's the being aware of what you know. Like, how do you know you know it, right? Oh, I've studied for that one, Dr. Rolfo. How do you know? Oh, I just know. Well, how do you know, right? Do you test yourself? Do you, quiz do you use Quizlet to, you know, to test yourself? How do you know? How do you teach so, young children, like early elementary school kids. so depending on what you want, I love checklists um, or metaco what I call metacognitive checklists. So, so I have, I create questions around the routines, backpacks, right? Making sure that they've packed everything up. Um, and then what I've done is I laminate, um, you know, a checklist and then I attach it to their backpack. And that list includes the routine that the student needs to do before they leave school and before they, you know, and then I create a routine for when they go home. So leaving school, what do you need? Make sure you have, you know, your handouts, your red folder, if your homework is being in a, is placed in a red folder, if your book is in there, um, make sure that's all in there. So it's laminated, attached to the backpack, and so Joey looks at that. And then, and, then, um, and then you check it, right? So did you check your checklist? Yes, mom. Okay, could, could we see it, right? And then usually, then you remove that scaffolding as he then becomes, that skill becomes automated, right? And then you check, and then that, it's just like teaching, reading, and writing and such, right? But it's a behavior piece, so you're guiding the behavior around that. Um, at first, you actually be the explicit modeler for that. This is what I do. Check, you know, mommy has to do that too. I have to put all of my, my cell phone, my bag, or whatever else that I need to put as my routine, and I'm putting it in there. And you, you ha you're the explicit, you ex explain out loud your thinking so that they can hear you, your own process, because it's so internal in our heads, right? It's so automatic. We just do it but we don't see that they actually need our thinking process be said out loud and explicit. So that's, it. does that help? So it's being aware of learning about learning. It's yourself, yeah, it's your own process of learning, right?
Yeah. Okay, how about the working memory? What is that? That's a short-term memory? Or? There is a research definition <coughs> between, defined definition between short-term and working, but working is really an infinite, um, no, not an infinite, it's a finite memory capacity. So if you learn new things, and the research shows that you can only, it's only seven elemental units of memory units in working memory, that if you don't practice that, it's never going to go into long-term memory. So for example, like our phone numbers now, they're chunked in threes and fours because our brain then sees 650 as an area code, and that's goes right into, and that's, 650 is not just three digits, it's now one elemental unit, right? Gra um, like schema maps, that really helps working memory. Graphic organizers, those things are so helpful for working memory because it looks at a very complex information like um, birds, for example, right? Or no, maybe not birds. Um, but it just breaks things down in, in, in all their little um, buckets. We'll work more around working. Uh, work memory is really like, that's a totally different um, workshop. Are but you saying working memory is <coughs> when you break it down, what's that mean? Working memory is just a finite capacity in your memory banks. So for new information, if you don't have any prior knowledge about the new, ta the new concept that your teacher is teaching you, then it's going to be hard for you to remember that if you don't practice it when you go home, if you don't read about it when you go home, if you don't recite about it when you go home, if you don't watch about it when you go home, it's never going to go into your long-term memory unless you practice it and unless you embody it or you know, kinesthetically practice with it. So the working memory is before the long-term memory? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. That's at least what the what the research is saying nowadays around that. And so with your partner, with your elbow partner, um, and the first person whose birthday is earlier in the year, go first. So think about that on who you want to partner with. <laughs> um, and really what this is, is, is is an exercise on all of us thinking about our child. What, what is going on with our child today? Right. What is a challenge? What is a behavior challenge that we're kind of focusing on, ruminating on, having sleepless nights over on um, at this very moment? It could have been different yesterday. It will be different tomorrow. But just for today, we are going to focus on just one, not all 10, <laughs> just one. Um, and then think about, right? Think about how you're going to describe that to your diet partner why it's challenging, you know, where it occurs, right? What time does it occur? Does it involve other people? You know, are there trigger stimulus, trigger situations, right? Think about then how you reacted to that situation. And then think about how, what, what was the first thing out of your mouth <laughs> when you, when your student, when you're thinking about that, how you rectified it or how you reacted at first. And that goes under that write down the dialogue. And don't do the write out reframe scripts because your partner is going to help you with that. So essentially, I'll give you two minutes to think about, you know, to describe the situation to your partner without naming the executive functioning skill. Describe how you interacted with your student to build that deficit skill. And then think of the scripts you've used to talk to your student about the skill. So that's partner one. So birthday before, you know, earlier in the year, that's partner one. If your birthday is later, you know, later in the year, you're partner two. Your task then is to be, to apply part, right? Be present, be attuned, resonate, and that way you can build trust with your partner. You're going to listen. You're going to acknowledge the situation because more, more times than not, we've shared that kind of experience. And then your task is to label you know, that EF skill that could have been an issue for your partner. Make sense? Play with me. Um, there is you know, truth in the madness. Um, so find your elbow buddy. We'll give you two minutes to think about it. So I'll time. What was some of the experience? What's some of the felt experience around acknowledging that there may be an issue? Maybe you didn't have an issue. Um, someone want to share out? So I think we both, ex we both um, in both of our situations, even though they're really different, there's a frustration that we get as parents that mm -hmm. 
where we can't, we're, we're we not can, but we don't provide that structure because we don't even have it within ourselves. Yeah. Right. That's a great realization, right? Yes. I guess the realization is the rescripting is really difficult. Right? I know. Frustration exactly. We just go on default mode network. We are just doing that, and it's a new habit. We can change. Yes. I think in, in our case, we realize that trust issue because, like, he keeps forgetting stuff every day, and so I already remind him by post the you know, post it in his file. Yeah. He still forget everything. Yeah. So how can I trust it? Yeah. So, right. But that's yeah. Why I try not to nagging him. But right. He always whatever. <laughs> he just kind of doesn't listen. Right. Right, so the frustration again, right? The frustration level you know, rises, and then, yes? I think we want share frustration over giving a very simple task, one thing we do every day, and then it out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or even just put your shoes on. Mm -hmm. You can come back 10 minutes later, after you've already repeated five times, you come back 10 minutes later, and we still don't have your shoes on. We're just spinning or doing yeah. something else. Yeah, yeah. frustration. It's not right. Internal. Yep, yep, exactly, exactly. Anyone else? Yeah, when I was in a cabin, I took the picture, and then the challenge was about having, uh, you know, a few kids. Yeah. Uh, one of them uh, having this really uh, trouble, uh, you know, winking, for example. Yes. And the behavior is being uh, playful and distracted and, and, and not participating, and, and how to help him to right. get attention, and of course, the sense of, our frustration, me as a partner, frustrated for reminding yes. my kids basic tasks. As exactly. The backpack, the, the getting in the morning, going at night. That's, yes. That's a big struggle, but I agree yes. with the structure of parents that we don't have it, so, so how, we don't, how do we model it? Yes, yes. And as teachers, I mean, you, as parents, right, we teachers face the same frustration over and over again. And actually, we even have a compounding issue for us because in the classroom, there's 25 other of, of them that could get the, them distracted. And then they get this wolf mentality. <laughs> um, and then they start behaving in many different ways. And so we learn as teachers and we learn as parents. But I think being mindful of the frustrational part of us and what was that Einstein? Was that Einstein who said, you know, uh, doing something over and over again the same way, but expecting a different result, right, is insanity. So when we're frustrated, we become insane because we repeat nagging and nagging and nagging on our kids. So I think this reframing piece and really creating purposeful communication, dialoguing with your student on how to modify the behavior is really a lifesaver. Um, and knowing that when you're frustrated, you just time out. And I said, you know what? This is really upsetting for me. I'm not upset at you. It's just I'm having a hard time with it. I'm telling you, your kids are going to look like, like, whoa, what just happened to her? <laughs> you know, They will just be so surprised because you didn't react towards them. You just said, I need a time out. And I can, I'm going to make a different choice. And it'll be amazing. Just try it. I've, I've tried it with my own kids, believe me. Yes. So, I have a question. So, the situation was that our kids are disorganized. So, they, yeah. they're not able to, uh, let's say, complete a task. For in her example, it was uh, doing laundry. So doing laundry. Doing laundry. Okay. So, is it too much to just sort of, let's say, let's put it on your calendar on, let's say, that day so that you have it on your calendar? Yeah. And then once you put the laundry, uh, yeah. I mean, a timer to like go and get it back? Yep. Is, is that helping or is that not helpful to let's Well, what's, do you really want the laundry done? Do you, do you want the laundry, you want to teach them chores, right? So whatever gets them to work and get it done, I would do it, right? It's not really enabling them because you're going to remove that. You're going to teach them how to do that. And we'll go through the self-monitoring strategies here too. So I'm focusing on self-monitoring and self-regulation strategies and more explicit instructions. So there's, a, there's this thing called goal setting, planning, and prioritizing, right? 
So if you look at all of the activities that your students need to do, categorize it. Is it an obligation? Is it an aspiration? Or is it, can it be negotiated? Right? And then help them predict how long it's going to take so that you can help them prioritize and then come back and say, OK, how much did it actually take you to do your soccer practice? How much did it actually take you to study vocabulary? I do this with my high school kids all the time. This is a really good visual for them. And then back it up with, OK, that's really how you do it, right? So I gave you the steps. But you back it up with the daily schedule, right? And then you give them the chunks of time. Because to kids, it's just like, oh, it's, you know, you only live once, right? <laughs> YOLO, you know, like, I can do whatever. No, you can't, but I'll tell you how, you know? So that's like, yeah, I want to binge watch Netflix, you know, but I can't do that, <laughs> you know? We, you know, there's, you, so we got to teach them a little bit. Uh, prior, that, that hits it, right? Prioritization, goal setting, and planning, all in one. Yes? Absolutely. Right. It's, it's really the, you have to, this is, the kid really wants to do this, right? This is what they have to do. And this is like, well, can you do it today or can you do it in a different time? But it's part of your responsibility to get things done. So you can define negotiation as the middle ground. Once you know what your obligation is and once the aspiration is, then figure out what goes into negotiation. So think about in your particular family what those activities are. So it could be different for others. So you need to define those norms for you guys and your family and then show them how this could look like for you know to to roll it out. Well, I think it's whatever you feel that is part of your family's values, right? We have families, I've worked with families who really don't like technology pieces, right? They really curtail that. And so that's not a negotiation. The, ca the daily schedule. It's just around predicting time and then inventory how much actual time it takes. So when you, ha it's, it's, it really depends on the age. I would say like fourth grade, I would start them in fourth grade. You know, your K through three, they really want more sturdy boundaries, right? And so you're the one who's really the executive function of your K through three. But it doesn't hurt to give the, you know, the third, the third graders, you know, their own little chores, right? You can start to create that, that for them. So they have this essence of my part in this society called my home. This is my role to make this household run. So you give them a job like we do in classrooms. We give kids jobs in the classroom. So we give our kids jobs at home. And then the other question I guess for the new grad is, um, can, you know, it seems like one drawback would be they would have a certain amount of time it would take to do and this is an obligation, but that takes a lot longer. Yeah. They end up feeling. Yeah, no, and that's where you say, I know that, you know, we overestimate or you underestimate it. Yeah, I do that all the time too. It, we're not impervious to it. So we just acknowledge that and then let's figure out, okay, so where did we go off? Because I'll do that too. So I think it's that acknowledging and reinforcing that the effort is there. Um, and then sometimes they may not want to do this. And so you've got to be careful around introducing it too. But I think this is a concrete tool. Let me ask her a question and then we'll go to you. Yes. Yeah. What, what do, can I do on I'm very mindful of phone use um, with little guys, you know, with middle schoolers and high schools, and even teenagers. I mean, I think I just like to use the good old Google Docs um, because um, it's easier for them to. There's a task bar and then all the Google Task and the Google Notes piece that's really helpful. 
I would also make sure that that interfaces with the school information system. Like Kahila uses Schoology. Some of you use Campus Infinite Campus. Some of you use you know, PowerSchool or whatever it is that it interfaces with the school's calendar. Because usually teachers have Google Classroom too, right? So they have it in their Google calendars and so that's really easier to, to track. Um, don't forget all of the, um, you know, the soccer practice, all of the other things that really encapsulate the entire being. I was wondering on the goal setting plan, um, the, the next day on their own schedule, um, I, I find that like you can do it for a few days or maybe a week at most, but then, you know, just planning out like every minute of their life is just really hard for anybody and, and especially for them. So like how much do you reinforce it or would it be useful just to do it like maybe one or two days out of the week? Yeah, you want to microdose it. <laughs> You're not going to turn them overnight, right? You want to just start to expose them into these new strategies, and then it'll come out. Because what'll happen is that more likely your schools will reinforce that as well. It's nice to go to parent nights when you, you know, back to school nights, teacher with your organizational system, so I can reinforce that at home. Um, and then, and then you start to remove the responsibility and give that to the student. Um, de again, depending on the age, middle school through a high school, totally doable, right? If they're resistant, there's more, there are more other issues around that, and you know, sky's the limit on the issues on that. But you want to just do the routines and the best practice around, um, especially with goal setting and, and calendaring, because um, you don't want to be their glorified secretary, right? Yes. It looks like it's more kind of similar to behavior therapy. It, it is that, but you're doing it not because you're frustrated with the kid and you're the drill sergeant, right? You've got to watch your intent because the kids feel that, right? And so if it's not working, then, you know, talk to other students, talk to the teacher and make sure that there's some level of progress and, and monitor it. Um, you know, and then figure out what's the criteria for success, you know, and chunk it a little bit because, you know, it's hard developing these things and do one thing first and don't try to fix everything is my, um, my advice. Um, the other piece is, you know, I'm not going to play um, the, this is Mark Brackett from Yale and, and he's really the director for um, emotional intelligence in Yale. And um, great, great um, video um, introduce, introducing social emotional. But really, my purpose for including his video is um, on page two of six on the companion slide. He talks about understanding emotions and emotion regulation as a distinct part of growing executive functioning skills. And here are the, here's a primary reason, five primary reasons for understanding emotional regulation, because it helps with attention, memory, and learning, because it helps with decision making, it helps with relationship quality, right? It helps with mental health, anxiety, and depression. So if we don't understand emotional regulation as part of executive functioning, then we are using a very, um, in inept model. So we look at the prefrontal co cortex, the cognitive domains, as well of, as the emotional, social, affective domains to create a healthy well-being. The center at Yale created this mood meter. It's really all about if you can name it, you can tame it. So it's on Apple. I actually used it, and I use it with the students that I, you know, and I actually track my own emotions. It was really cool. Um, and you know, you can say, how am I feeling right now? Okay, I'm happy, right? Or I'm joyful, or I'm easygoing. So you can see that it goes up and down the spectrum. And when I say I'm easygoing, then it gives me a reason. It forces me to put in like a reason why I'm easygoing. What's going on in my life? So I am journaling that, right? And then I'll say, okay, whatever, right? We'll go next. And then do I want to stay in the green or do I want to stay in the yellow? So I go to the yellow and then it gives me strategies for going up to the yellow.
right? So it's helping the students engage and be aware of the emotional energy that's going on in their body. It helps them pause. It helps them say, you know, own the anger and then let it dissipate. It's really quite amazing. Um, so I've used it on me. It works on me, <laughs> yes. Oh, you know what? I've used it with my fourth grader, actually, who gets very emotionally dysregulated. So the other rule, um, the other tool for the Yale Center for Intelligence, Emotional Intelligence, is what they call a meta tool. It's called the best self, right? Creating an image of your best self. What does that look like? And what can we do to create that best self? Right? It's that future selves um, research, which is great. It helps build this like compassion and empathy and, and making right choices. And then positive self-talk and reappraisal. Um, I didn't really plan well, and I didn't, you know, I missed it. It's okay, I learned from, what did I learn from this? I can, I can do it better next time, right? Um, that's on the student and on the teacher, you're, you're, or the parent, you're using your reframing scripts. I really like that you saw that, and this is a learning moment for all of us. I've been through it. We can, you know, let's try again next time. So you teach them resilience. In the end, it's a family journey, right? We're all in this together, and I think as adults, we need to form that. It takes a village to grow these kids nowadays, and we need to help each other grow those skills within us and among us to help build a better society because we need that today. So when we're feeling safe and loved, right? When you're feeling heard, you're feeling witnessed, you know, we're changing that chemistry in our body. The cells in our body are actually changing to promote growth and resilience. And that's kind of what we need in today's society, you know? That literacy of the heart and that executive functioning itself lends itself to that. So it feels like each little portion of this, you could do a whole workshop. Oh, yeah. Because you're just such a Absolute. plethora of information. Yeah. Um, but can you speak at all, and I love the technology helps and that type of scaffolding, but can you speak beyond the breadth um, mm -hmm. of the somatic approach mm -hmm. to developing this? Because that's kind of where I am. So. Yeah. Oh, God, I love that. It really is about having them be aware of what the sensations that's going on in their body, right? A lot of my high schoolers, when they're feeling stressed, they're feeling like stomach pains, that they're getting migraines, right? Because that is the stress that they're feeling. And yes, they may, may be, you know, predisposed to migraines or whatever it is, but research has shown, right, that, you know, the work of John Kabat-Zinn, that by using a mindfulness awareness approach to the sensations of the body and naming it, and not just running around frenetic about it, that it subsides. That when we mirror that to the children and to my high schoolers, they come in crazy being, and I'm not saying I'm the miracle worker, but I'm just saying I'm just there to hold them. Sometimes I can't do anything about it but I'm just there to hold them. And nine times out of 10, they, they come out pretty regulated. And I said, so what's the next action we can do? And it really just decreases it. I, I just can't explain it. I mean, the work of Oren J. Sefer, he's, um, he's at Spirit Rock. He does a lot of the somatic, um, you know, trauma healing kind of work too. I'm still trying to understand it's an attention issue, right? <laughs> you know, we don't know if it's working memory or whatever, but clearly he was not present to hear the teacher to say, bring this home, right? And then he just went on to the next one. So really the intervention there is just slowing it down. When I present questions like, okay, so tell me what I just said, right? So I know that they know, but if it's a more, comp right, so if it's more complicated, then they need to practice it, and then I'm watching them practice. But you can't just tell them to go do it, and then they'll do it. They won't do it. You need to be there. So paraphrasing will be any skill. Yes. The skill will be paraphrasing to 
one Yes. One only, one for, for working memory, create lists. So write down what you think. Draw me a picture, right? Um, that's another one. Act it out. You know, show me what you just did, right? It's a kinesthetic, visual, and um, sensory. Yeah. Yeah. And I could have posted in his uh, file, mm -hmm. two bottles today or two jackets today. Right. Me, but still, he doesn't do that. Is right. Is that through, like, organization problems? Could be. Yeah. Could be. I mean, there are many other issues. And it, the other piece is that, is it only happening at school? Is it happening at home? Is it happening at right. auntie's house, right? So if it is, then, you know, I mean, usually I use like a biofeedback, like a buzzer, you know, to timer. Like, okay, this is, okay, I feel this. Oh, oh, yeah, that's what I need to do, right? It reminds me. Yes. Sorry. What about a student who, like, we just won't use their tools? Right. Right. Like, I'm trying to oh, yeah. So what's the value added of using the planner? Does he remember? Like, if he doesn't see the value of using the planner, why should he take time to That's do it? Kind of okay. Right? Exactly, yeah. exactly. So kids are so smart. So, you know, being a parent, you're always going to parent education classes, and there's often this concept of letting them, you know, middle school, mm -hmm. like learning, you know, the natural consequences. Yes. So they go to school, they Yes. Right? Or you have their chores laid out and they know what time you're supposed to be in the car. And they yes. In the car time because they're late every yeah. single day for two trimesters in a row. Yes. Not catching on. So you're feeling like natural consequences. Yes. Got to let them feel their bottom. But, but, but they're not, they don't always feel like they're working. So what is, how do, what's the marriage of the right amount of helping them with tools when right. they get to middle school and the right dose of Gosh, if I had the formula for that one, I'd be making a lot of money right now. No, I do think that, I mean, especially for kids who have really dis deficits in executive functioning, you want to help them, right? You want to scaffold them. But, but then you start to slowly see, observe them. Is it automated skill already? Then if, and if it is, then I can start to pull back, right? And then when you release them at school, you want to talk to the people at school to say, this is what we're working on. You know, this is an issue for him, and we've worked a lot on this at home, so now it's a new setting. So they may not transfer the skill into the school, so that's another piece, right? The, the executive functioning, developmental, contextual, and environmental. So you may have mastered it at home, but you may not have mastered it at school, and so we'll need to scaffold that. And it's a lot of partnering with the, with the teachers. But I do have that sense of, yeah, there are sets of natural consequences, and we'll just have to figure out what the baseline is. Thank you. Thank you for being here.